Welcome to the Internet History Podcast. I'm your host, Brian McCullough. On HBO, the show Silicon Valley is about a young kid who comes up with a billion-dollar algorithm and attempts to build a company around that technology. Well, there's a real-life parallel to this story because that's exactly what happened to Danny Lewin in the early 1990s. Lewin co-developed an algorithm that gave birth to the content delivery network industry, and the company that he co-founded on the strength of this technology is Akamai Technologies. To this day, Akamai is a major backbone of the entire internet. But that is only one of the fascinating things about the story of Danny Lewin. Born in Colorado, Lewin's family moved to Israel at a very young age, and Lewin eventually became a special forces operative in Siret Mekal, the elite anti-terrorism unit in the Israeli military. Tragically, Lewin was one of the passengers on American Airlines Flight 11, which was hijacked on September 11, 2001. There is reason to believe that Danny Lewin was possibly the first person to be killed by the hijackers on that day. In this episode, we're going to talk to author Molly Knight Raskin, who has written a book called No Better Time, The Brief, Remarkable Life of Danny Lewin, The Genius Who Transformed the Internet. This book chronicles Danny Lewin's amazing life story. It's a completely fascinating read, which I encourage you to purchase and read for yourself. I actually had the book on my shelf and intended to do an episode on this story eventually when we got to it chronologically, but when Molly reached out to me herself, I decided to jump on the opportunity to tell the story when I had the chance. So please give a listen to this fascinating episode, a conversation with Molly Knight Raskin about the brief, remarkable life of Danny Lewin, co-founder of Akamai Technologies. Molly Knight Raskin, thanks for coming on the Internet History Podcast. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. So uh, we're going we're gonna to be talking about um, Danny Lewin, and he's the founder of, of Akamai. But even though I, I'm sure most of our audience would know who Akamai is and what they do, um, since it's not really a, a big consumer brand or anything like that, can you just start off by explaining um, what, what Akamai Technologies actually does as a company? Of course. Yeah, I mean, I never, um, I never, uh, you know, anticipate that anybody who's interested in the book or any audience knows Akamai, and that's not because their imprint on the internet hasn't been extraordinary, and it's not because you know they're not a big name in internet technology. But um, as you mentioned, uh, Akamai is—it's not a consumer brand, it's not a household name, and that's because it's a content delivery network. Um, most people who don't know about internet technology can't even tell you what that is. I couldn't before I wrote the book. But what it does essentially, the fastest way to describe it or the easiest way is to say that Akamai is um, like the FedEx of the internet, or it was the FedEx of the internet when Danny Lewin and Tom Layton, co-founders, created it back in the mid-90s. Akamai basically provides uh, content companies, media companies, with a fast, efficient, and secure way to deliver their content to end users over the Internet. Um, And so they do this by using or relying on this vast network of servers positioned all over the world that, when taken together, act as a sort of a fast lane or superhighway that supersedes the slower, more congested routes of the internet, the routes that data usually takes and can get clogged up in or slowed down on. And it, the result is that the companies that use Akamai have come to rely on them, again, for not only fast delivery of content, but also total, total efficiency and security. And what I was amazed by as I was researching the book and learned this is that the algorithm that Danny and Tom came up with, the first set of algorithms to create the technology, function so well that, in essence, the more data that was out there, the better the technology functioned. So it, it totally scales with, with the amount of data going across. Precisely. Well, let's, let's, start, with, uh, let's start talking about Danny. Um, so Danny Lewin, Danny Mark Lewin, um, he grows up in Denver, Colorado, right? 
That's correct. And um, he's a he's a tech kid from the beginning. They have a, I believe, in the house they they had a, an Apple II and an Altair at some point, right? That's right. I mean, that that's really one of the fun parts of Danny's story is you know from an early age, like a lot of um, a lot of people who make an imprint on technology, he. His interest was very apparent to his friends and his family, even his neighbors. He was teaching early on, sort of had a little business before he was even a teenager, showing people in his neighborhood how to um, use home computers. And you're right, at that time, um, the, the, the Lewin family actually, were the, they were the only family on their block in the 80s, early 80s, late 70s, to have a home computer, PC. And they had an Altair and then one of the first Apple computers. And is the what what sends the family to Israel because um you describe in the book that in many ways Danny's a very um you know all-American kid and um in a Jewish family but but his father uh gets into Zionism is that what leads them to Israel Yeah it was definitely an unlikely unanticipated turn for Danny and for the rest of his family except for his father, of course, who was the one who made the decision. But yeah, Danny had a very all-American childhood. He grew up in Denver, Colorado. His parents were both doctors. He had two brothers. They all went to the local uh, high school, junior high school, playing sports, going out with girls. Um, Had a really nice life, Um, very pretty house outside the foothills of Denver. And then really very abruptly in the early 80s, Danny's father, Charles, who is a psychiatrist, decided that he wanted to relocate the family. And, you know, the family, they were a Jewish family. They would, they would go to temple, but they were not at all, um, you know, leaning towards Orthodox Judaism. They had visited Israel once or twice. But the idea of packing up and moving to Israel in the 1980s, the early 80s, which was not an easy time to live there, was um, actually pretty devastating for Danny at first. Um, he was the eldest, and he was pretty crushed. He he kind of um, he kind of rebelled a little bit after after the move. He did rebel. I mean, in some ways, and of course, I interviewed his parents for the book, and I think they would agree with me. They they lucked out in that he didn't rebel in a way that was too damaging, which as all of us who know teenagers know, they, they can do very easily when they're, when they're angry. Um, he did rebel. I mean, he was, he was devastated. Like I said, it really took his early teenage life and upended it. And he had, you know, worked to already make a close network of friends. He was already excelling in school. He was popular. He was interested in sports like football, which they don't play in Israel. And so this was, a real shock to him, and he did. He he rebelled by, I would call it silent anger toward his parents, and he really didn't speak to them much for the better part of a year or a year and a half. How and how old was he when they moved? He was fourteen. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, d- would you say that he eventually in- embraced life in Israel? He absolutely did, and that is where the story, to me, took a really interesting turn. I mean, again, and this is very common in families who move their children uh, and make aliyah, as the term is in in Zionism, um, moving to the Holy Land. When people upend their families like that and move to Israel and they have teenagers, it's quite common for those teenagers to kind of rebel in a much more drastic way, to kind of go off the edge, to run away, to party. And instead of doing that... Danny rebelled, again, like I said, it was in a sort of a silent way, and it was very much his own way of rebelling. And the way he did that was by essentially throwing himself into Israeli society and culture. He he wanted to do it his way, and he wanted to prove, I think, to his family that he could succeed there, but not in the conventional ways that they may have wanted him to. And by that, I mean, you know, his father had grown increasingly religious. Danny didn't really grow more religious in Israel, but he did grow very in love with the culture, with the people, with the intensity, which really for him was already innate. And so I would say, you know, what's interesting about Israel is that he moved there against his will, and yet in landing there, it actually turned out to be a very good fit because it matched this, the culture and the people matched this innate, inborn intensity and drive that Danny already had. And that includes him, um, well, it's compulsory uh, uh, military service in Israel, 
Um, so he he does join the IDF, but he joins a, an elite counterterrorism unit. That's right. And in fact, it is not compulsory if you're not native born. So Danny had the option of choosing not to serve in the Israeli army. But by that point, you know, he was 18. He'd been there a couple of years. He'd made a lot of friends. He was doing well in high school. And he was, this is also very unlikely for a mathematical technology genius. He was spending a lot of time at the gym, sort of bulking himself up, building his physical strength. And while he was at this gym in Jerusalem, which is where he spent most of his time, again, sort of rebelling against his parents, um, he met a lot of young Israelis who had come home from military service. And they would be pumping iron and they would be regaling him with all these almost Hollywood-like stories of missions, counterterrorism missions, and he became kind of fascinated by it. And I think, again, it appealed to not only his physical strength, but also his interest in doing something that was bigger than anybody anticipated. And so it wasn't compulsory for him to serve, but by being in this environment where you were valued by your contribution to the military just as much as you would be for your academic success, he decided that that was something he was going to do. And he, he even um, he becomes an officer. He, he excels in, in, this, in this unit, right? That's right. And this is, this is also an area of his life where, I mean, if you told people the story who didn't know anything about Danny Lewin, it almost seems unbelievable because it was very, very unusual, if not unheard of, for a young man who was not native-born, had no connections within the military structure in Israel, to not only get into one of the most, if not the most, elite unit in the Israeli army, it's a unit called the unit, and it's, um, and, or it's called Sayeret Matkal in Israel. And it's so secretive that those soldiers in the unit actually don't even wear military uniforms. They are, uh, all of their missions are top secret, and it's part of their duty as a code of silence. Um, these missions are so high, prof- high profile within the military that they're not allowed to speak with them outside. And so when Danny first started telling people that he wanted to join the military and then also be a part of Syret Matkal, he was almost laughed at by people who know the Israeli military and know how hard the training is. And so it was pretty extraordinary when he did make it into Syret Matkal. And again, in, in early stages, people still didn't believe him. He had to actually show his insignia or lift his shirt up and show a weapon to prove to people that he really was in that unit, and then rose very quickly to become an officer. And most people say it was really not just his physical strength, but really his intellectual um, capabilities that caused him to succeed in that unit. So because it's so secretive, do we know anything about any missions he might have gone on if he saw combat or anything like that? Um, I wish. <laughs> Um, again, you know, even the most, I think, you know, as a journalist, it was, uh, it was a challenge to me to go over to Israel and even to get people who served with him to talk. Because, again, it's a code of silence until your grave. You never, ever talk about your missions if you're Syrat Matkal. But I do know for sure that um, he was engaged in, in active duty in combat, that he had, um, as part of those combat missions, he had actually engaged in warfare and um, and killed people, and that his missions were, during that time, um, we sort of was later leaked that Sayeret Matkal um, had engaged in some really high-profile missions during that time. We don't know exactly which ones Danny participated in, um, or if he did, but, you know, the examples of the kind of missions that that unit carried out um, were the kind where, you know, they would go in in the middle of the night, a whole team, uh, you know, get uh, zero in on a very high-profile, dangerous terrorist, capture him, and get out and leave not a trace. And so it was a really exciting but dangerous, um, dangerous duty. So... So after a few years of this, uh, Jason Bourne style stuff, uh, we, he, he goes back to, he goes back to, I guess, maybe his roots and, and he goes back to school and back to computers and computer science, right? That's right. I mean, you know, it was really was sort of unusual that he joined the military. Again, I think he did it because he really wanted to sit in in Israel and that was the way to do it for a young man of his age. But 
the thing that the subject that really captured his heart was mathematics and theoretical mathematics and computer science. And he spent most of his free time, even during high school, reading books, studying computers, technology, math, sciences. And that's what he was interested in. And so he always had it in the back of his head that he would go to graduate school and pursue some sort of higher degree, perhaps a PhD like his father. And um, he, he attends the Technion, is that I, I'm not familiar with it, so and probably most people aren't. Can you describe what the Technion is in, in Israel? Yeah, absolutely. So the Technion is, actually it's often called the MIT of Israel because it is the most prestigious institute of technology pretty much in the world, along with MIT. And, um, you know, it's founded um, on the belief that Israelis, because there's so few natural resources in Israel, um, the natural resource of the Israelis is this incredible ability to create this, the spirit of innovation, of creating something out of nothing, and of extremely bright engineers, scientists, mathematicians. And it's in Haifa, which is on the coast of Israel. It's a very beautiful, beautiful city, about two hours from Jerusalem, where Danny lived. And to get in was, and still is today, a huge coup. It's extremely competitive. And Danny got in without any problems, even though he rarely went to class. Apparently, when he was in high school, he still sailed through with top grades. And so he left the military for the Technion and um, you know, joined the ranks of a lot of very famous, well-known mathematicians and scientists who had been there. And that leads to MIT itself, then? Yeah, MIT um, was for Danny was really the pinnacle of higher learning in his mind. And, you know, he had, he had thought this out very well when he was planning to go back to school. And he always knew that while he would start out somewhere in Israel, he would ultimately love to pursue his dream of becoming a professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And as if I couldn't make up or write a better story. It so happened that one day Danny was in the library of the Technion, where he was already hugely successful. I mean, he he was married at this point. He married at 21. He already had a wife and, and a child, an infant, and he won best student thesis at the Technion and was really making waves, and he decided to apply to MIT. And the reason for this was that he was in the library one day, and he picked up this massive textbook by a professor at MIT named Tom Layton. And he opened this book and took one look at these algorithms, and basically it was love at first sight. It was a language that you know very few people understand, but Danny did, and he was fascinated, intrigued, sort of obsessed with meeting Tom and working with him somehow. So he applied to MIT and was accepted and moved the family to Cambridge. So the the algorithms that he falls in love with, it, it, they're they're theoretical algorithms, right? It's not, it's not you know the Google algorithm or the algorithms that would eventually go into Akamai. It's it, he's just falling in love with with the, the 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 theoretical mathematical nature of the algorithms themselves, right? That's exactly right. So these were these were algorithms that had anybody looked at them at the time um, would not think this is something that might one day be translated into something practically applicable for technology like the internet. It was, yeah, it was very high theory, ivory tower math. And, uh, you know, again, Danny's dream was to be a professor. And Tom's dream was to spend his life as a tenured professor at MIT, which he was already well on track for. And, Yes, what he fell in love with really wasn't anything that looked like a business idea. It was this beautiful, incredible math that, you know, Tom Layton called uh, like a work of art. And that's the language that the two of them spoke. I mean, these kind of algorithms in this math really excited them. So if they're both academic-minded uh, people, um, you know, they, they hook up and, and it, it's kismet and they, they, they can speak this language and... and, and... You know, you could obviously see that they could go on to, you know, a, a long career as, as professors and math professors doing this sort of thing. How does it, who, 
who has the idea to turn it into a business? Well, the idea really came from Danny and his connections at the Sloan Business School at MIT. Tom was the first one to look at Danny's master's thesis, which he wrote um, in his second year at MIT, and Tom was his advisor. And he was the first one to look at this concept, these algorithms that Danny had created, which he called consistent hashing, and look at them and say, this is absolutely extraordinary. Um, and, you know, Tom said at the time, what Danny created wasn't a technical tour de force, um, and in math, you often want to have that kind of thing, but it was this incredibly elegant um, set of algorithms that were beautiful. And so Tom was excited about it, um, but his excitement about it was really rooted in the simplicity of the idea, that Lewin had taken this succinct problem, you know, one that was easy to state but impossible to solve, which was the speed of the Internet at the time and this weight, this worldwide weight, and he created the solution on paper that was simple and elegant, and obvious, which is really, you know, brilliant in mathematics. But it wasn't something that Tom immediately thought, let's go out and start a business. So it was really by chance that Danny was hanging out with a good friend of his from the Sloan Business School who said, you know, there's this business contest at MIT. Why don't you think about taking your idea and trying to develop a technology, trying to develop a technology for the Internet and entering it into the business contest? And really, I don't even think Danny would have actually done it had he not been so strapped for money. I mean, at the time, like a lot of graduate students whose loans were piling up, he and his wife were strapped for money. They were stressed. And so he thought, why not? Let's go for it. And, and Tom is... was a reluctant participant early on. He was not really into the idea of a business initially. And this is the, the, the 50K competition at MIT, right? That's right. So today it's the 100K competition, but back then, which was 1996, it was the 50K competition, and it was, you know, organized by the business school, and the competition was really, really stiff. I mean, a lot of brilliant ideas um, came out of the business competition. Some of them are huge corporations still today, and they lost. They did not win the competition. So, it, you know, it wasn't... Um, at that point, the business plan was still flawed. They, they weren't business guys. They had no idea how to write a business plan. And so what they came up with was, you know, looking back, um, essentially flawed. Um, the idea was great, but the business plan was flawed. And um, the winner that year, I think, was Direct Hit, which was um, also a technology company mm -hmm. and very successful. Yeah, advertising. Um, mm -hmm. So what what's uh, again now what what prods them further down the road obviously this is late 96 into 97 so we're talking about when yep. the the boom years are really starting for the internet so is is that part of the motivation or how do they get further down the road towards starting a company yeah it's definitely part of the motivation because look this was as we all remember an extraordinary time we haven't seen a time since then, that was similar in the speed at which people were creating these startup companies, the crazy success almost overnight of some of these ideas. And so there definitely was an atmosphere in Cambridge of startup excitement. It may not have equaled Silicon Valley's excitement and the atmosphere and the buzz there, but it was there. And there were definitely already stories out there of, you know, Students turned multimillionaires, turned technology titans, and the allure was definitely there. But I would say that what really propelled them was sort of the perfect um, environment of, again, the technology boom, this incredible race to new ideas, um, but more so the fact that, you know, Danny really started to realize the more people that he spoke with, and he brought on, again, a couple of team members at this point who were more business oriented and started to talk to venture capital investors who said, actually, you know, they're really, if somebody could figure out a way to speed up the internet, they could find a way to end the worldwide wait. It would be a gold mine. And really what, you know, what surprised me in researching the book was that it really, it wasn't the money at that point Danny wanted to pay his bills and be comfortable and stay in his house or get a bigger apartment. But 
it was the big idea that drove him. And so the more people sort of challenged him to end the worldwide wait, the more I think he began to think, at this point, I have to do this. I have something that I actually do believe deep down will work. And I have a lot of doubters, but I'm going to go for it. I, I don't know if you've watched that show um, on HBO, Silicon Valley, at all. Yes. But it, it's it, I, when I was reading this, it's mm -hmm. funny because it is almost exactly what that character had. You know, the yeah. character comes up with a better algorithm. That's essentially what, what Danny has. <laughs> That's essentially what he does have. And, you know, there were a lot of folks out there who were completely um, baffled by him. I mean, keep in mind that, you know, here he is. He, he doesn't even look the part, right? So he's not only a 20-something-year-old college student telling people like, you know, Tim Berners-Lee that he has a way of ending the worldwide weight using theoretical math, but he's telling big-name investors who are putting their money into companies like Yahoo and, and all sorts of exciting new technologies. And so he, yes, I mean, in some ways it was, people thought it was audacious and absurd. And Maybe had the timing been different, it would have been. But the fact was is that the idea actually, once they got, with the help of a lot of smart business folks, once they got a business plan that worked, the idea, the algorithms were solid. And, you know, that really, over time, is what contributed to Danny's legacy, which was that the algorithms really haven't changed. Even today, the foundation on which the company is built you know, is, is the same. The algorithms are the same. And, but other people were thinking, you know, I remember folks at CNN, for example, telling me that they, they looked at Danny and just thought, are you kidding me? We have all the money in the world, and we're just going to keep building out our server farm. Mm -hmm. We can build 12 football fields if we want, and we don't need you guys. You know, get out of here. Go back to your ivory tower. So there were a lot of doubters and a lot of naysayers, and, you know, it was just this exciting time of great – risk-taking, and I do think they got caught up in that a little bit, but maybe that's what gave them the courage, you know, to leave um, what was a very comfortable, if not, you know, very um, profitable life as professors. But, you know, there's there's several good stories here. One of the reasons they're, they're so successful so fast is because the algorithm works so well. So just a, a couple stories that I liked from the book um, were, you know, one of their early successes that, that proved that um, the, the algorithm and, and Akamai's technologies were, were durable was around the, uh, the original launch of the, the Phantom Menaces. Uh, was, it, was it their, uh, the, the trailer that went online? Tell, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, that's really, um, <laughs> it was a great story. And one I think they still kind of almost laugh about today. So, um, you know, Tom Leighton, the summer that they were testing out the prototypes for this technology, um, he had a bunch of students, undergraduate students at MIT working for him, who were just crazy for Star Wars. They were these, these programmers that were up all night, you know, playing these, these games, uh, Star Wars computer games. And at the time, um, there was a new Star Wars trailer that was just about to come out, and it was an incredibly exciting time, as much anticipated. People were going crazy because this trailer was going to stream online. And so um, everybody was kind of clamoring to, to see it. And Akamai knew at the time that this was going to be a big opportunity to showcase their technology. I mean, keep in mind, they have the technology, but they also in some ways needed – these these big events, big news events, to prove it because they need a lot something. Of customers... They need something that's going to crash somebody's servers to prove that exactly. your servers won't crash. Right? <laughs> exactly. They needed something to crash other servers and would, you know, and would also just prove that they could jump, jump into the rescue. And you know, a lot of people could handle their own traffic at that point. So um, this this new trailer came out, and it was you know episode one, the Phantom Menace. And it was premiering in theaters nationwide a week later. And so earlier that month, I guess someone at Paramount's Entertainment Tonight had contacted Akamai and asked if they could deliver the trailer for their website. And they agreed. But unbeknownst to anybody at Akamai, Star Wars, um, the producer, George Lucas, had already struck a deal with Steve Jobs. And Apple had planned to release the trailer on Apple.com. 
and Lucas's uh, website, which is StarWars.com, and they were going to use QuickTime, which was Apple's new streaming technology, and they were all very excited about it. Well, the night of the trailer's release, everybody's in the control room at Akamai. They're all watching Entertainment Tonight stream, but everybody, because they all know it, is going to Apple's website. There's been a lot of publicity. And someone came running into the room and literally screamed, Apple site is down. And that was the moment that really put the company on the map because it wasn't just Apple's site, but all these other websites that were attempting to screen, screen bootlegged version of the trailers. And um, so but, Entertainment Tonight. But, right, but I was going to say, the Akamai, the, the Akamai servers stayed up, right? They stayed up. They stayed up. And um, Entertainment Tonight wisely chose Akamai, their free flow technology. And again, this is still in really early phases, so it was a bit of a risk for, for Entertainment Tonight. But they smoothly handled um, you know, thousands of hits per second. And uh, the system never even exceeded, I think, 1% of its capacity. And that was when the phone calls really started coming in. It was kind of like, wait a minute, who are these guys? And one of the people who said that was Steve Jobs himself. Who, who calls them at some point later and, and says, I want to buy you. That's right, yes. Um, in fact, they called, and, and Danny was out of the office, but Paul Sagan, who was then president of the company, picked up the phone and and um, at first he thought it was a prank. <laughs> it, was just, it was April Fool's Day, and he thought it was his brother playing a trick on him. And he realized it was the real Steve Jobs. Paul Sagan, who we've mentioned on the podcast before because he was with uh, Time Warner or Time Inc. Yep. Um, yep. Internet before that. Um, another story, because this was a, a big deal uh, by deal, I mean, you know, a business deal for the company, was when they got a shot to prove their technology to Yahoo. Yes. Well, that was an incredible moment as well, um, and one that I love because it was just Danny and Paul Sagan, and they were out at Yahoo, and you know that was really this huge coup for them because, uh, as David Philo, co-founder of Yahoo, told me that year, they probably had thousands of bright young internet technology entrepreneurs walk through their offices. Amazing ideas, incredible stories. But more than a decade later, um, David Philo at Yahoo still remembers that when Danny walked into that office that day and had their 15-minute shot at presenting Yahoo with Akamai, um, they were really impressed. They were um, blown away in some ways by they, they understood. They got the algorithms and they understood the idea. But at the time, they didn't want to take the risk. And so they sort of said, wow, that's amazing. But like a lot of companies at the time, I mean, big companies like Yahoo, they were all, you know, do it yourself. And that was the biggest competition of Akamai was do it yourself. So people could say, wow, that's a great idea. And then they could say, but we've also got a bunch of amazing mathematicians, computer scientists here. Why don't we try and figure out a way to do this that's, that's similar but different, right? And Yahoo, this crazy-sounding business out of Stanford, um, finally at some point called them up. I think Danny just really he, – he was known for just this dogged determination and would call people and like sit in their lobbies until they would say, okay, it's, it's time for you to leave. This is getting out of control. <clears throat> and so they um, – <clears throat> excuse me, at the time – you know, <clears throat> Yahoo was a really hard sell because it was growing so fast that really nobody could catch up. And so by necessity, as I said, they were pretty much self-sufficient when it came to managing their congestion. Mm -hmm. And so Danny and Tom uh, and Paul went in and met with them. They had a connection, I think, at Sequoia Capital, the investment firm out in L.A. And Paul Sagan still remembers this incredible moment when David Philo literally turns to him and Danny and says, would you agree to uh, serve a page on our website that has our Visa logo on it, this, this homepage? And they thought, you've got to be kidding me. They couldn't even believe it. And so they tried to sort of contain their excitement, poker faces, very professional. Um, I think on the spot, David Philo asked them for the documentation that he needed to become an official sort of test customer of Akamai. And... 
within an hour, they were using their free flow technology on this one hidden pixel that was buried deep on Yahoo's site. And it worked um, beautifully. And David Philo immediately asked them to stream this Visa logo, which the company displayed on every single one of its home pages. And Danny and Paul said something like, okay, I think we can do that. And they succeeded and they walked out of Yahoo and they they had a rental car, I guess, that had gotten upgraded that day. And, and as, as Paul recalled, they just <laughs> drove down Highway 1 screaming, Yahoo! <laughs> that, that put them on the map, too. Those were the two really pivotal moments, mm -hmm. you know, with, with Apple and Yahoo. So they, I mean, th this is not unusual for this era, but um, being one of the first uh, companies to prove CDNs as a, as a technology, mm -hmm. they um, yeah. they actually IPO, what is it, only nine months after forming the company? Yes, exactly. So um, it was crazy, basically. It was crazy. And even people at Akamai, you know, within Akamai thought, Danny was crazy for wanting to take the company public so quickly. But again, it was this, this crazy time. I mean, you know, businesses on the back of business plans on the back of napkins, getting millions and millions in investment. And they just decided to, to take the risk and go with it. And it was an incredibly exciting IPO. Um, and it really ended up being, I guess, I think it was the fourth largest of 1999. So it was just crazy. And again, probably a reckless decision, you know, to some, but it worked in their favor. <laughs> and overnight, basically, on paper, um, Danny, Tom, Paul, George Conradis, uh, formerly of IBM, were billionaires on paper. And it was, you know, really an incredibly exciting time. Um, I think on its first day of trading, uh, the shares closed at $145, which is up 450, 458%. Mm -hmm. So valued the company at $13 billion. Yeah, the, those of us that, that remember that time, remember um, Akamai was really one of the highest flyers uh, uh, toward, yeah. towards the end of the boom there. Um, so is is Danny in his still in his late twenties at this point? He is. He's twenty nine at that point. Okay. So and, and he's worth um, around two billion dollars. Right. So my question is, um, did you get a sense of you know <laughs> what what is he thinking of what his life's become at this point? He he didn't set out to start a company. He <clears throat> thought he was going to have a life in academia. He. And uh, is all of a sudden a billionaire and, you know, a, 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 a titan of, of, of business and things like this. Yeah, no, that's, that's part of the story that really fascinated me. I mean, because I, I really wanted to, to get to the human, the person. What, what drove him? What did he think? What would he have become had he not um, died so young? And what was fascinating to me is that you know, no matter how hard I looked, and I looked hard for evidence that he, you know, that, that the pressure was difficult for him, that he, he cracked under it at all, that he um, had times where he really felt like a failure. And again, I wasn't looking at it because I wanted to find chinks in the armor. It was because the story was so extraordinary that you just wanted to, you know, I kind of yearned for these human details. When life changes so quickly even for the better it can really pull the rug out from under you and Danny went from you know worshiping Tom Layton as a professor at MIT to his best friend and business partner running a multi-billion dollar company and it was not what he expected it was not what he planned but what amazed me was that he really did have an uncanny ability to handle the stress of that incredibly well. And I don't know whether it was the military training or it was just innate. I suspect it was in some part both. But, you know, he would go literally days without sleeping. He spent, he and Tom, for the first two years of that company's existence, spent 24-7, which, you know, a CDN requires 24-7 oversight. You know, if, if there was five minutes where someone logged on and couldn't get onto their website because of Akamai, they would lose a customer. And they 
life was just so different than than what they anticipated. I think you know, particularly for Tom. But with both of them, the money really didn't change anything. And and I think that was the one area where I was just truly fascinated because I would sort of say as I interviewed people, you know, come on, this guy, he's a billionaire. Of course, he must have changed. Didn't he do anything reckless, you know, go buy an island? Or mm-hmm. And as the story goes, and I had, you know, repeated confirmations of this from everybody within the company who was there that day, the day of the IPO, Danny's response was, get back to work. He sort of chink, clinked a glass of champagne but he wasn't much of a partier. He wasn't a reckless spender. He wasn't that interested in material wealth. He bought a bigger apartment and a bigger house and a couple motorcycles. And that was it. Um, so I think it was also that he had this innate sense that life is short. And, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't at all that he had premonitions that his life would be short. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. No one would ever know. But it was more that because he had lived in Israel so long, um, served in the army, even at a young age, I think he understood that everything, including that kind of wealth and that kind of success, is ephemeral. And he wanted something bigger. And so in some ways, funnily enough, he was never really satisfied. And when the company reached its pinnacle, he was already thinking of things that he could do that were even better and thinking about going back to get a PhD and doing some sort of fi- finding something, um, you know, some great thesis that he would write about infinity and the nature of infinity. And so he wasn't, um, I think so in that, in some ways at heart, he wasn't really a businessman. I mean, he was a brilliant businessman, but his dreams and his passions were in this great idea that made the world essentially a better place. Well, and also, you know, unfortunately, as we as we go into 2000 and 2001, Akamai was not at all immune to the, the dot-com bust as well. No. Because, you know, what's happening as all these dot-com companies go under is these are Akamai's customers that are going under. So, exactly. you know, they're losing clients left and right and their stock, you know, I think it drops something like $300 in like 18 months or something like that. So, yeah. So going into 2001, um, he's they're they're really struggling to to keep the company afloat, and they they have layoffs and things like that, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. So it was you know yeah it, it crashed the stock market crashed the bubble burst the company relied Akamai relied on dot com customers and they were going out of business like dominoes and every day they were losing at some point you know multiple customers a day. It was a total disaster. And they, at that point in time, were, you know, there was a flurry of financial decisions, you know, offloading real estate. Um, The staff had grown so quickly. I mean, multiplying practically overnight. There were, um, they had all this office space. It was just, where can we cut? Where can we cut? It was, how do we stay alive? And... Around 2001, sort of the early, late, late summer, early fall of 2001, um, things were looking desperate, and they were at that point seeking to really offload um, more employees and trying to rethink the whole business model. How can we keep this business alive? There will obviously be internet businesses for, you know, maybe all of these pets.com are going to go out of business, but surely there's another way we can do this. They were starting to look at more kind of blue chip companies that were moving online, but things were still very bad. And um, yeah, things got worse. So unfortunately, that leads us uh, to about September. And on um, September 11th, Danny is scheduled to fly to L.A. It's, it's, it's just a routine business trip, or do you know what, what the trip was specifically? Well, it was, it was uh, no, it wasn't a routine business trip, but it was um, an attempt to salvage a customer. Mm-hmm. So, um, so it, it would have been something that he would have been doing a lot at this point. He had been on that same flight back and forth to L.A. something like three dozen times that year. It was, it was a flight that he was making regularly. Business in L.A. was regular. They had offices at one point in California but closed them down when things got bad. So, yeah, it was pretty much a routine 
um, flight, he was tired because the night before he and Tom had been up almost all night figuring out who they had to lay off, which was a painful decision for both of them considering the company was basically their friends. It was family. You know, they, they these were friends they hired. They'd fought through thick and thin. They'd gone through this incredible experience of the IPO. They'd made people millions, and now they were having to tell them that they were fired. And so he had spent the night doing that. He was tired. I think it was um, there was a lot going on. But it was a routine flight, so routine that he would he got on the plane and knew the name of the flight attendants and um, sat down in business class. And he's he's working on his phone uh, until they tell them to, to shut it off. They're closing the doors, right? Yes. He had a habit of, again, squeezing the most out of every minute, every second of every hour, and he was on his phone with the in-house attorney at Akamai, actually, until this, somebody, one of the flight attendants said, you know, sir, you really need to turn your phone off. And um, so that was it. And the flight took off uh, on schedule at around 7 a.m. that morning. And this is American Airlines Flight 11, right? That's right. American Airlines Flight 11 was flying from Logan Airport bound for Los Angeles that morning. The regular regular flights so there were a lot of business commuters on that on the plane so what have you been able to piece together about the the next 15 20 minutes or so um, of the flight well uh, what I pieced together comes directly from the 9/11 Commission report and the you know years of research that followed of piecing together exactly what happened on the flight We'll never know precisely what happened every moment. Um, we only know so much. Um, so I'm careful when I talk about Danny's story to say he was, you know, most likely this is what happened to him on the plane, but we don't know for sure. But what we do know is that the next 45 minutes were horrific. At some point, about 12 minutes after the flight took off, uh, the terrorists on board, there were five of them, they were all sitting in business class. In a crazy twist of irony, they were sitting so close to Danny, he could have reached out and touched them, which, having gone back and sort of recreated this in my mind, um, I thought, you know, he knew, Danny knew Arabic, and he had been trained in counterterrorism in Israel. He must have known very early on that something was going wrong on that flight. But in a pre-9-11 world, the question would have been, well, what do you do? Maybe it's just going to be hijacked. Maybe these guys, who knows? Nobody would have, no one would have ever thought that something so horrible would happen. It's what happened next. So about 10 minutes into the flight, five terrorists began to hijack the plane. They killed one of the flight attendants or, or stabbed one of the flight attendants. He was um, lying there bleeding, and at that point in time, one of the courageous flight attendants in the back of the plane managed to make a phone call to ground control, actually two of them, young women, very heroic. And they were able to very calmly lay out for ground control what was happening on the plane. And so what we do know is that in business class, there was a passenger seated at 9B, which was Danny's seat, and at some point on that flight, he rose from his seat and engaged in some kind of a struggle with the terrorists on board. Unfortunately, he didn't know that there was a terrorist seated behind him, Satam al-Sukami, who stabbed him from behind and killed him before the plane crashed into the World Trade Center. It was the first flight, Flight 11, to crash into the Trade Tower that morning. So... I'd say, you know, Danny was most almost certainly the first victim of September 11th. Um, we don't know because we don't know exactly what happened on board. And um, almost certainly got up at some point and engaged in some kind of a struggle with the terrorists. So Danny's 31 years old at this point. 31. Mm -hmm. Now, Wife and two children. The, I don't know if ironic is the right word for this, but on that day, on September 11th, the fact that the internet does not go down, w w despite the fact that a lot of cell networks and, and telephone networks went down, um, almost proves, you know, Danny's legacy with the algorithm and and Akamai. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it is it is an irony. It's a tragic irony that on the very day that Danny died, you know, he had spent a long time 
you know, many years ever since he came up with this idea, he had talked about a time when there would be some cataclysmic event that would cause people to turn to the Internet for information, that, that would cause phone lines to go down, that would interrupt what then were more commonly used forms of communication. And he was right, and that day really was September 11th. You know, it was, I call it in, in the book, it was the 100-year flood um, you know, version of the 100-year flood for the Internet. People were all over the world were turning to the Internet for information. And for the very first time, really, with that kind of event and that kind of traffic, the Internet totally failed. And it didn't totally fail, but there were lots of websites, including CNN.com, that could not handle the load of traffic that day. Now, CNN had been a client of Akamai's. They had sort of gone back and forth because Akamai was very expensive. You know, it was, was the, the most expensive CDN at the time, and they were testing out their own technology at the time, and they sort of scaled back on using Akamai. But that day, again, in a tragic twist of irony, they had reached out to the company and said, please help us get back online. And, and so that day, September 11th, um, in the wake of Danny's death, knowing very early on that he had died on that flight, um, losing the heart and soul of their company, Akamai was responsible for keeping so many websites live that day, including websites of government agencies like the FBI, airlines, emergency management websites. And yeah, nobody outside of Akamai or people who had dealt with the company really knew that Danny was responsible for that same technology that helped keep those websites live and helped us get information well, and, to and people all even, over the world. Even the government reached out to them on that day, right? Yep, that's right. So um, they did and still do uh, work with a lot of government sort of three-letter agency websites because part of their model and certainly growing part of their business is, is Internet security. So there were a lot of websites that were handling sensitive information that day that relied on Akamai to keep things moving, to keep information flowing. Molly, when did you first hear about this story? I first heard about this story, actually, the week before the 10th anniversary, sorry, the week before, a couple of months before the 10th anniversary of September 11th. And it was totally happenstance, really. Um, and for me, serendipity. And I say that because I got so much out of writing this book just personally, um, and, and I hope have brought this story and grown the legacy of Danny's, um, you know, impact on technology. But I really heard about, first heard about Danny through his best friend, a guy named Marco Greenberg, who runs a marketing firm in New York City, met Danny in Israel in the 80s. They became fast friends. And we were talking one day, and he said, you know, that he had always wanted to tell Danny's story and that there was some interest within the company of some kind of a tribute to Danny, which is what I ended up doing. And what started as sort of a, a corporate story ended up becoming a book. And, you know, I think the story, I was very intrigued as a journalist that the story had never been told. I was in New York on September 11th, and I spent my entire year, um, a very stressful, sad year, covering stories of victims of September 11th, I had never heard Danny's name. And so when I heard his story, what fascinated me the most was that it wasn't a story about 9-11. It was a story about somebody who created something bigger than himself, something that, that lasted and outlived him and has become so much greater even in, after his loss. And, and the family was, was cooperative? They were. They were reluctant. And so a good part of writing the book was finding a way to communicate to them that I wanted to write a book that would inspire young people who are interested in, well, really anything. I mean, in innovation, in technology, in computer science, in military service. Um, he was successful in so many arenas of his life. And I just really felt as I began to research his life more, his personality was coming so alive to me, and I really liked him and admired him. And I felt like I could convey that to readers. And the second thing was, you know, for his family, I just pretty much told them that, you know, there's 
son had made this impact, you know, that that 60, 70 year old CEOs of hugely successful companies were still reduced to tears talking about the impact that he had made on their lives in such a short time and how he had changed their lives and made them better people and made them want to start new companies and pursue new things and and live larger. And for someone in their 20s to do that is so unusual. And so, um, so yeah, the first before I started writing the book, I flew immediately to Israel and met with his family. And I had this whole thing prepared to say to them, and I ended up scrapping it the minute I walked into their apartment in Jerusalem and just speaking fully impromptu because I felt like that's what Danny would do and that was the most honest way to approach it. And and it worked. They were they were actually really happy with the book. I think, you know, it obviously brought back a lot of painful memories for them. But mm. they were they were amazing, amazingly helpful and um really happy when the book did come out. So his his wife and children moved back to Israel? No, actually they still live in the Boston area. Mm. Um, his wife has remarried, um, started a new family Mm -hmm. and his children are, you know, they're growing up in college and yeah, I was going to say they, they've got to be adults by now or close to it. Yeah, they are. They are. And, um, Anne Lou and Danny's uh, wife will still, you know, says today that they remind her very much of Danny. They're both, um, great students, very vivacious, strong, young men. Well, uh, Molly, this is such a fascinating story on on so many levels. Um, the, the book is called uh, No Better Time, uh, The Brief, Remarkable Life of Danny Lewin, the Genius Who Transformed the Internet. Um, I, I, I told Molly before we started that um, I read it all in one sitting. It's, it's really, it's very compelling and a great read. Um, so Molly Knight Raskin, thank you for coming on the, the Internet History Podcast and sharing that with us. Oh, well, thanks so much for having me, Brian. It's really been a pleasure. Hey, guys. Normally, this is the part where I ask you to rate and review the podcast on iTunes. And please continue to do that. It really helps us out. But in this episode, I want to specifically encourage you to purchase the book that we've been discussing, No Better Time, The Brief, Remarkable Life of Danny Lewin, The Genius Who Transformed the Internet. If you do intend to purchase it, Could you please consider doing so by clicking through on the Amazon link in the show notes for this episode? Or alternatively, there's a Amazon banner on the top right hand side of our website, internethistorypodcast.com. If you purchase via that link, the podcast will get a small percentage of your purchase total. Every single book so far that I've purchased to do research for this project has come from Amazon. So if you buy something on Amazon but click through that link before doing so, you will directly help finance my continued work on this project. And actually, I just discovered this weekend that the entire Charlie Rose back catalog of interviews is available for purchase on Amazon. So something tells me that in the next year or so, I'll be buying a lot of Charlie Rose interviews of tech luminaries and the like. So please consider buying Molly's book, No Better Time. It's a fascinating story, as you've just heard. And if you do so, please consider clicking through on our link. Even if you don't buy the book, consider clicking through the link the next time you're purchasing something on Amazon, and you'll help my continued research. As always, thanks for listening.